right, and welcome to everyone as they're joining us. So we're gonna wait just a minute or two to make sure everybody can get their technology set up and get in before we get started. And I'm just going to repeat for the people just now joining us, we're going to wait a minute or two to make sure everybody can log in before we get started. Right. We'll go ahead and uh, people can trickle in and join us. Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Ali Kowalski. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator for the Sacramento History Museum. And thank you so much for joining us this evening for the Lost and Found Year. A reflection and discussion of the obstacles and opportunities, struggles and successes of serving the community as one of Sacramento's museums, arts and cultural centers during the pandemic. If you're not able to join us for the whole evening tonight or if you have technical difficulties, don't fret. We will be posting a recording of this presentation to the Sacramento History Museum's YouTube page following the event. And I have just put the link to that page in the chat if you would like to take a look. Before we get started, um, I wanna thank you all for joining us and encourage you all to ask questions tonight. I know webinars can feel a bit strained without us being able to see each other's faces, but we really wanna hear from you and are happy to share our experiences and journeys over the past year together. You can ask questions in both the Q&A and chat features of Zoom, and we will get to as many as we can by the end of our presentation. I also wanted to mention that the Sacramento History Museum recognizes that it sits on the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Nisenan and Miwok Native people. The Sacramento region was a gathering place for many Native groups, including the Southern Maidu and the Valley and Plains Miwok, and we extend our respect and gratitude to these peoples. This museum has a responsibility to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of these lands and their culture, as well as the histories of their dispossession. We recognize the role of our exhibits, programs, and relationships, and the roles they have in shaping those histories. Finally, I want to introduce our panel for this evening. Tonight, we have a very diverse set of representatives from Sacramento's cultural sector, including those who work with archival materials, who curate collections, and who interpret exhibitions. Delta Mello is the Executive Director, CEO of the Sacramento History Alliance, as well as a Chair of Sacramento Area Museums and a Board Member for the California Association of Museums. Veronica Candle is the Curator of History for the Center for Sacramento History. William Villano is an Archivist for the Center for Sacramento History. James Scott is the Librarian and Archivist for the Special Collections of the Sacramento Public Library. And finally, Jesse Knox Jensen is the Chief State Library Services Bureau for the California State Library. Although I personally would love to rave about each of their accomplishments, I'm going to turn it over to them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their organizations. So with that, Delta, would you like to take us off? Thanks, Allie. Um, yes, I am the um, director of the Sacramento History Alliance, which manages the Sacramento History Museum uh, the old Sacramento Visitor Center, and also the very popular underground tours of old Sacramento. And um, I am, uh, I've been in the nonprofit world for quite a while, <laughs> working in um, places such as the Sacramento Zoo, uh, the California Automobile Museum, and the California State Railroad Museum Foundation. I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. Veronica, would you like to go next? Hi, um, I'm Veronica Candle, um, curator of um, collections at the Center for Sacramento History. I basically deal with three-dimensional artifacts. Um, the center is the re repository for 
um, and the collector for the city and county of Sacramento. And we mainly utilize our three-dimensional artifacts at exhibits in the um, Sacramento History Museum. And we also do exhibits for the city, um, having some in City Hall and some of the other public buildings. Well, we use our three-dimensional collections basically to um, talk about the history of Sacramento area, how people lived, um, um, you know, what kind of activities they did, businesses, organizations. Um, uh, I've been um, in, with the center for about nine years now. Previous to that, um, I have a master's in museum studies and I was uh, worked at the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan and um, the Grand Rapids Public Museum in Michigan. So um, nice to be here. Excellent. William, would you like to finish? Uh, with Veronica, I also work at the Center for Sacramento History and my role there is as an archivist. Uh, well, two master's degrees, one in U.S. history and culture and the other in information sciences with a focus on archives and records administration. Some of the tasks that I handle at the center is I'm in charge of our digital preservation programs. I am responsible for approximately 9 million photographs and photographic negatives. We also do preservation, description, and access to government documents and private documents dating back to the 1840s. We also have a tremendous film collection that is one of the top 10 in the country that covers um, local Sacramento news from KOVR, KVIE, and KCRA from approximately the mid 60s up until the 1980s. Uh, in a regular day, normally before the pandemic, we would try to do as much reference work as we possibly can to get all of these valuable historic and cultural artifacts and materials and all the information they contain to the public, to local scholars, local people around town who want to understand history, their culture, and where they came from, as well as professional scholars, journalists, and genealogists. Great, impressive. <laughs> All right, James, would you like to go next? Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is James Scott, and I'm the librarian for the Sacramento Room, which uh, is basically uh, the special collections and archives of your public library uh, in Sacramento County. Um, we live in the original reference room of the 1918 Carnegie-funded main library, so right at 8th and I. Um, we opened in 1995, and we're kind of an interesting animal in the sense that we're a hybrid. We're, the first thing you see when you walk in the room are open stacks, um, books everywhere, so very, very library in, in that regard, but we're also in archives. Um, since 2010, we've been uh, collecting manuscript collections, um, arranging them, describing them, um, all of them have a roadmap on the online archive of California. So we kind of walk both worlds for sure. Um, the room itself is rustic. Um, it would probably remind a lot of people of an East Coast Ivy League reading room um, right in the center of downtown Sacramento. So um, I'm lucky. It's a great job. I've got great patrons. Um, we probably serve somewhere around 3,000 unique uh, visitors a year pre-pandemic. Um, we also have a robust digital collections uh, that's powered through Content DM, um, about 7,000 digitized units that are fully described and accessible anywhere in the world. So, um, yeah, we do a lot of different things. Uh, and uh, it, it was an interesting year for us. And um, we had to pivot here and there. Um, but like the rest of us looking back to, or looking forward to getting back to uh, the way things were a little bit. Fantastic. And Jesse, would you like to finish us off? Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Jesse Knox Jensen. I'm the chief of the State Library Services Bureau at the California Library, and I have an MA in Public History and an MLIS. And prior to my work at the State Library, I worked at the uh, California State Archives and was an archivist and had a couple of different roles there. 
Um, so the State Library Services Bureau, or SLS as we call it, um, it's a very large bureau and we're a large organization. We're charged with preserving and providing access to California history and heritage. So we have seven library sections and six public reading rooms with distinct collections that include the Whitcomb State Law Library, the Braille and Talking Book Library, the Government Publications section, the Information Services section, the California History section, and the Sutro Library in San Francisco. Um, we do have, uh, we're located on the San Francisco State Campus uh, in the J. Paul Leonard Library in San Francisco, and we have two buildings uh, across from the Capitol um, downtown. And we primarily serve uh, state government employees, the legislature, um, people with disabilities, genealogists, academic researchers, and the general public. And prior to the pandemic, um, we perform traditional in-person services like library circulation, library loan, reference. Um, we provided access to our books and special collections material. Um, in many respects, we were still using very traditional ways of doing things like um, catalog cards and paper forms and whatnot. And so this was a really big transition to us, for us, and I think it went um, really smoothly in the amount of time that it happened. Excellent. Um, so I really love James used the word pivot, and that's going to be my first question for our panel tonight. What was your biggest pivot, change, adaptation to meet your mission in response to the pandemic? And um, Jesse, would you mind talking about that first? Sure. Um, like I mentioned before, we were um, very in-person uh, service oriented and um, even the services we did provide that didn't involve in-person services like interlibrary loan, which could be done um, via the mail, we still had to be in the buildings for. Um, and so when we shifted to telework, um, it happened in the span of maybe two days. And um, we, I have more than 60 people in my bureau. So it was a really large transition for all of us to um, move to virtual work overnight. Um, so I think, you know, initially it was getting laptops out to folks, um, bringing home ready reference materials so we can continue to, you know, answer reference questions, um, you know, taking work home like cataloging and things like that um, to keep us going. And we also worked um, a lot on transcription while teleworking. So I think um, to be able to make that leap and still provide in-person services was really challenging. Um, but for us, it was really a rewarding experience. I think um, you know, the transition to virtual meetings and whatnot allowed us to actually have meetings where everyone was in attendance, especially because we have a branch in San Francisco as well as branches in Sacramento. Um, and so for us, we hit the ground running uh, the next day, answering emails, having meetings, um, providing you know, virtual services for patrons. Um, and so it was an incredibly quick transition, but um, everyone who works at the State Library was absolutely wonderful and flexible. And um, I think it was a really awesome accomplishment to be able to do that. Excellent. Um, Veronica, could you speak to how the center and you with collections specifically had to pivot? Um, yeah, in um, it, working with the artifacts, I, I don't work as much with the public as our archivists do. Our archivists, and William will, will definitely touch on that. Um, so uh, a lot of what I was doing um, was um, working on the increase in social media that we found we had to do um, in order to, to be able to get ourselves out to the public. And um, I must admit, I am, um, I, I call myself a Luddite. I'm not a technology person. Um, and so it was very hard for me to learn how to do the social media. Um, but I think in, in the long run, um, it really helped increase the visibility of our three-dimensional collections, which I, I really appreciated. Because we can't, as most um, museum collections, um, only exhibit about 10 to 15% of their collection. Um, the social media, putting artifacts up on social media gave us a chance to um, share those objects with the public um, and share objects that we normally wouldn't be able to. So um, I found that as, um, as a big learning um, 
not curve, but it's a, a, a something to learn. The other thing is, as Jesse was saying, um, being part of the city, uh, we are on, we have a lot of um, requirements as far as our, our um, computers. And so when we all transitioned to working at home, um, there were a few days where everything was just in, in flux and you know people couldn't get on, could get through the, um, the firewalls, just trying to connect between a laptop and your, your desktop at work. Um, that, that was pretty difficult. Um, there, I, I remember spending hours on the phone with our RT department, just trying to be able to get into the, uh, the laptop. Um, and so those, uh, that was certainly something that um, was a big, big challenge is working from home. We didn't think we were going to be able to do it. Everyone said, oh, no, you know, we have to be by the collections, but we've learned how to do it. I still can't figure out how to share documents, though. That's okay. I struggle with that one, too. <laughs> um, William, would you like to talk about the archive side of the center? Uh, so with the archives, we actually had two shifts that we were simultaneously undergoing. One was a shift in what we could actually do at the center. We found that suddenly we didn't have in Perth in reference. Suddenly we didn't have our 30 volunteers coming through and we had a little more opportunity to focus on physical preservation or catching up on some of the We lost your volume. Oh, am I back? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, as I was saying, we, we saw a shift both in the services that we could give to the public, as well as the more behind the scenes services of things like preservation and arrangement that don't always get the big press. So we found that suddenly we had a little more time instead of doing reference, we could do more and more preservation we could free some of our volatile negatives. We could focus on our backlog a little bit more just to describe them and have everything accessible to the public as well as a massive digitalization undertaking. Uh, we've managed to digitize nearly every naturalization record that we have, which is one of our more high use items because everyone likes to know when grandma and grandpa came over and became American citizens. So that was an interesting pivot for us. On top of that, we did have to pivot to a different type of researcher. We noticed that some of our more academic researchers, we would have people fly across the country from Princeton to work on their dissertation with our collections. That was no longer an option, but we saw a significant uptick in interest in local history from a different class of researcher. So we had a lot more of people buying in the Sacramento market and asking about, hey, what's this house I just bought? kind of, you know, I'm not a historian, I'm not a genealogist, I'm not a professional researcher, but making that transition to having a more professional researcher focus to more of a, a common or lay focus, still being able to provide access to all these people, explaining more often what a finding aid is and how we can help out. The amount of people who had no clue that we existed or even what an archive was, was tremendous. And we just have to kind of go back to basics and say, hey, this is who we are, this is what we do. You know, we have to realize that at times we can't give you 25 boxes full of materials and we have to narrow it down a little bit more. So we've had really interesting projects. We're still continuing our digitization and digital projects as well as uh, working on getting more and more of our content online where in the past we would do speaker series. We'd bring in local scholars related to local issues and have in-person programming where now we are doing those interactions either via Zoom or recording in person and then posting them online. So as much as possible, we're trying to you know, maintain our close to normalcy while still adapting to the times, addressing what we can while we can, and really trying to cater to our researchers as much as we can and acknowledging the differences that are happening between different levels of skill. Excellent. Um, Delta, from a museum standpoint, would you like to jump in? Sure. I, I, I don't think the word pivot is a good word for us um, in the beginning. We were right in the middle of our school season and um, immediately we had schools canceling, 
Um, we had to refund quite, quite a bit. There was so much that was prepaid. And this wasn't something that we could just figure out, try to figure out how to do differently. They were gone. <clears throat> Children weren't in school. And um, if you remember in the, er in the early days, and it was very questionable about how long it was going to last. So we were saying, well, maybe next month. And then it, you know, after, uh, after two months, it was clear it was not going to be anytime soon. So um, we stopped our school programs completely. And um, at that point, we did realize that what was needed was some kind of um, content for families that were at home. So we created homemade history and we put together very, very crude when we look at them now, um, but they were, they were little videos on things that families could do together, things, um, you know, informational, but also um, project um, based. And um, so we started putting those out. We also had a, um, a, set, a series of videos that was based on Old Sacramento that had been professionally done about uh, a year before, but really hadn't gotten any traction. And they were meant to be for people coming into Old Sacramento to learn more about um, some of the buildings and people who live there. Uh, but what, <clears throat> excuse me, what we found out was when people came to Old Sacramento, they weren't really interested in it. When they couldn't come to Old Sacramento, suddenly they were very interested in it. And we got a lot of, um, great feedback as we parceled out these, these already well-produced um, videos. So from there, we tried to think about what's coming up and, and, and there is where Pivot came into play. We looked at all of our different programs, um, summer camp, starting with summer camp and um, moving on because everything we do was based on in-person. At the same time, we had an exhibit that was due to open the weekend we closed. And it was an extraordinary, is an extraordinary exhibit. A lot of money had been put into it. A lot of interactives that couldn't be touched now. And so, um, so we tried to think about how can we bring that exhibit to people? And basically our mantra was, um, let's try it and let's try anything. And see what works. If it works, uh, we will use that as a model and move to the next, you know, use it for uh, another, another, um, another type of program. I think one of the most successful things we did, other than the TikTok phenomenon, I don't know if we want to talk about that <laughs> later, but one of the most successful we did, things we did early on was a um, melodrama, murder mystery melodrama. We had been rehearsing prior to, and I, I remember when we were rehearsing one night and somebody looked at their phone and said, oh my God, Tom Hanks and his wife have COVID. And um, somebody said, well, I won't worry about it until they close Disneyland. And that happened shortly after that. So <clears throat> we had this murder mystery melodrama that's all in person. And we started thinking, well, we don't know when we'll open up, but we'll keep practicing like this in the Brady Bunch boxes on Zoom. And at um, one point we realized it was kind of fun and let's see if we could do this um, as a program. And it was, we figured out how we could interact and we learned a lot about Zoom and it was just really fun. And I, and I think for us, it has been, let's do things, let's try things, um, let's have fun. Let's see if we can still continue to um, get you know get some history um, out there but um, let's keep people engaged and remember that we're still here because one day we will open again <laughs> excellent and you did get to open again recently <laughs> thank goodness for that all right i'm hearing a lot of um, really successful things um, so maybe james do you want to talk about what your proudest accomplishment over the last 12 months has been yeah, so um, <clears throat> there are a number of things that actually really went right, um, but probably the biggest. And um, you know, I can I can look to William and, and Jesse to maybe jump in here a little bit on this. But the the Sacramento Archives Crawl um, is an event that's held every October uh, during National Archives Month. Um, it's it's been going on for about a decade. 
And just, just a quick overview, the four big repositories in the Sacramento region, uh, the Sacramento Room, Center for Sacramento History, California History Room, and the State Archives all open up their doors, uh, bring in um, affiliate uh, history societies um, and other folks to show their wares in addition to us showing ours. And typically things um, address a topic or a theme, a more general theme. And so essentially a brick and mortar, you know, sort of petting zoo kind of event um, that's just gone so well through the years. And so when the public health crisis hit, we all on the committee and our little work group for Archives Crawl got very uptight, very nervous, didn't know how this thing was going to come off because we did have some feeling that we would not be able to have a traditional Archives Crawl. But as, as a credit to a lot of the imagination that my, my colleagues possess um, in the library world, the archive world, the um, public history world, we were able to put something together and it was a virtual archives crawl. Um, just to give you some metrics, um, when the event was over and it basically went all, all of October, we had gotten some 13,000 13, unique visitors to, the, to the, the Facebook page for the archives crawl. And then for YouTube, we had, had about 1,200, which was just astonishing because we were very likely getting our, our, our standard crawl goers. But the implication is with those big numbers is that we're getting new people um, who are going to be interested, um, not only in a virtual archives crawl, which is likely to happen again, um, little news flash there, um, but, um, you know, when we do actually return to the standard deal, they're going to want to come in and, and visit the Sacramento room, see the Center for Sacramento History, visit that beautiful reading room at the State Archives, and of course, come on into the State Library. So to me, that was a tremendous win um, for all of us. Um, and you know, Delta mentioned, you know, the importance of staying relevant and, and staying remembered. Um, that's something that I think went really, really well to a lesser degree, but, but still very important. Um, we had lots of time and I'll draft off William on this point is that we had time to process collections that had been sitting around for quite a while. Um, and we could, we could process them thoroughly process them well, do a really slick granular finding aid, throw it up on the OAC. Um, and what a relief to have that done um, because it's sort of off our docket, but it means access to all of our researchers just like that. And then, um, you know, we, we do publish, we are a content creating organization. Um, so we published in the past, but with nine, 10 months, um, we were able to publish a lot. We were able to get a couple of articles done um, and then also do a book um, primarily with uh, two colleagues at the Rancho Cordova Library. So um, there were some good things. There, were, there was a pretty thick silver lining to, to everything that was going on still crazy, still weird, still a lot of uncertainty, but we did get a lot of good stuff done. Fantastic. Um, Jesse, would you like to talk about maybe your biggest accomplishment? Sure. Um, we did a lot of different things while we were working remotely. Um, and one of the things that I think we're the most proud of is our COVID diaries project. Um, so again, this is one of the projects that we had people from all sections of the library working uh, to get off the ground. Um, so we were able to collaborate um, using virtual platforms and things like that. Um, but basically we launched an effort uh, to work with local libraries and literacy programs um, to collect COVID-19 stories from across the state. 
And so um, we initially started with a form up on our website and then um, we were able to start showcasing submissions and Californians of all ages have responded by sending in um, original essays, poems, photographs, um, videos and works of art. Um, so we showcase those on our website. Um, we've also received physical submissions as well. Um, it was really one of the first uh, collecting efforts we've done where the majority of what we received is digital um, and could be made available immediately as well. And um, some of the pieces that we received were incredibly moving and touching. Um, I know I shared the project uh, link that's going to be shared in the chat. And we still have the submission form up on the website and we're still actively collecting and adding uh, new stories to the COVID Diaries webpage. And um, I think some of the submissions uh, really show everyone's creativity and positivity um, in getting through this. Others were um, you know, really kind of heavy and talking about you know, being separated from family and things like this. Um, so it was really quite a moving experience and it still is going forward. Um, I see that you've shared some of the uh, links in the chat to a couple of my favorite submissions, um, which I think are really interesting. Um, and in the future, I'd like to keep this project going in some way, shape or form um, so that we have a way to collect um, experiences from the public uh, going forward. Um, they're gonna be really valuable in a few hundred years when we look back and start thinking about you know, what happened during this time period and how did it affect us in our daily lives. I think what I liked the most about our program was that we worked with public libraries. Um, so we received submissions from people of all ages, um, especially school children who you know, wrote out their thoughts and feelings or um, you know, did illustrations to kind of process what they were feeling. So um, it was a really impactful project and uh, really hope that all of you listening would also be interested in contributing. Um, we did include the link in the chat. So please do feel free to submit your thoughts um, as well as photographs uh, or physical items if you'd like to mail those to the library as well. Yeah, um, I was really impressed when I first came across the COVID diaries with the sketch of uh, Dr. Fauci. That was really well done um, and an interesting way to kind of remember this time. Um, Delta, did you want to talk about your biggest accomplishment? Well, it's odd and um, very unexpected uh, and um, just a joy. We have uh, been uh, a TikTok phenomenon. We have over 880,000 followers on TikTok. And one might question using TikTok for a museum or a history um, organization. But we, again, trying something new, we were following one of our, one of our staff members, uh, Jared Jones, was following a, a TikTok account um, from a museum, a history museum in the UK. And he said, I, I'd like to try it. I think we could do something like this. Um, and we would take our docent of 22, I think it's 22 years he's been with the museum. Um, and he works in our print shop. And let's just film, you know, film him doing what he does. Um, he comes in weekly, he gives school presentations, but he also um, prints all of our, our bags for our store. And and um, our greeting cards and, and some other things. And so he actually does work on these um, 100 plus year old printing presses. So they started playing around with it and we got uh, 10,000 followers and we thought, great, that's amazing. We're done, but we kept going and kept growing. And so it has ultimately, um, it was fun in the beginning and it has become business now. Um, serious business. It does bring in money per views. Uh, we also reached just this week um, some national um, fame, I guess. Uh, we were on NPR yesterday and um, they had followed, they had found us because somebody was following it. So what TikTok has done for us though, it, is ha it has helped us on our other platforms. And again, it has given us a, um, it has brought our um, identity, our brand, I guess you will, if you will, um, to a higher level. And we are 
being recognized as a museum to, that people would want to visit. And we are a very small museum. We're dwarfed by the uh, California State Railroad Museum next door, often overlooked and or confused with that museum. And so this has been really, really good. And um, when we go back to you know, accessing people that we wouldn't have normally gotten to, we had a, we had a particular program that um, had people from England and um, Boston and um, upstate uh, Northern California that knew of Howard and his TikTok and they wanted to come to this particular event. These are people that we would never have um, had any access to. The other thing about TikTok, we're talking 880,000 followers, and they are a demographic that would not normally come to the museum, perhaps. Um, so we are reaching an audience in 59 second segments and, um, and having fun with it and, and being authentic. And it's been, it's been a joy. 15 minutes of fame that won't last forever, but we'll take it while we got it. Excellent. Um, William, did you maybe want to share your perspective? For me, one of the biggest accomplishments has been maintaining the forward momentum uh, that we've established. Uh, I had so I had been in Sacramento for less than one year when we entered into lockdown, but during that time, I noticed some preservation issues and we managed to get quite a bit of funding for a large uh, cold storage facility that will go into our vault to help us preserve our nitrate and acetate based film and photographs. One of the big, you know, this is a very important project for us to be able to maintain all of our very, very valuable film that is not duplicated anywhere else. So to be able to keep that momentum going forward, while we also had staff change over two weeks right before lockdown began. So for us to be able to continue what we're doing, adapt and really hit the ground running with a staff turnover, to be able to digitize film, um, we had a tremendous uptick in our request for film because the center actually licenses quite a bit of our copyrighted materials. And as soon as everyone went into lockdown, every TV and film and documentary production country company in the entire country said, we've got a captive audience. Awesome. Let's give them as much content as they can because people are going to be watching TV. So we were digitizing film at an incredible rate, much higher than we were as a previous year, all while still maintaining our forward momentum, serving these researchers that we have remotely, getting them the content. But also in doing so, we were able to digitally preserve a lot of the kind of worst of our materials that are starting to see damage. So keeping those going and being able to hit the ground running with a whole new staff member, being able to train them on the fly and not actually you know, see the individual for more than 30 seconds at a time. It's, it's something that I'm tremendously proud of. I feel like our preservation efforts are going to keep these materials around um, for at least another couple hundred years. So until the next pandemic, perfect, perfect. Um, Veronica, did you wanna speak about yours? Veronica, you are muted. Sorry. Um, similar to what Jesse um, did, um, what we started was a COVID collecting uh, initiative and we put up on our website, um, First of all, just working to get the, the website up itself was, was a struggle. Um, and um, what we did is ask people to contribute digital images, um, artifacts. Um, um, we had someone that donated a song that they produced, um, all in relationship to COVID. Um, now, one of the things is that for us, we have the digital images um, right away, which is good, but we still have yet, we have um, artifacts that we have had to um, wait for a while to collect in person because, you know, especially when we started, you know, there was um, a lot of um, talk about how long can you, you know, have an object and touch things and, you know, when is, is COVID going to be transmitted if you, you know, hand something to someone. So we've had to put those type of um, kind of requirements on people. 
but we have a woman who has made a quilt out of her masks and um, another uh, gentleman who did a blog, a walking tour of his neighborhood um, the first few days and he took images and, and photos. So um, I think that that is certainly one of our um, biggest accomplishments. Um, also during the, um, the summer when the Black Lives Matter um, uh, started, we also then developed an initiative to collect items for the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, so very similar to the um, COVID, ask people for images, um, photographs, um, and any type of um, three-dimensional objects that we might have. We've gotten a few signs, wonderful signs from um, protest um, movements. Um, some of the um, rallies that were downtown by the Capitol. So um, I look at those as, as um, it's new for us. It's not something we've done before as far as putting out that, that kind of call, especially on that media. Um, so I really see that as an accomplishment. Um, it's been interesting too, because um, when, the, when COVID hit, uh, people didn't have a lot to do. A lot of people started going through their attics and their basements and their garages. And so we got, we received a lot of calls about um, items that people would like to donate, which is great. But again, you know, one of the things is we're still now starting to be able to collect those things, actually get those things in person. Um, and um, I, I know that um, Allie is going to put up the uh, link for our COVID collecting. Um, as Jesse said, we're still collecting too for either the Black Lives Matter or the um, COVID initiative. So um, that would be, yep. Yeah, I think that that's, um, I think for, for us on the collecting, the artifact collecting side is, is our biggest achievement. Excellent. And yes, that link is in the chat now if anyone wants to take a look. Um, Veronica, I'm going to ask you to talk about the other side of the coin then. So what was your hardest learned lesson over the past year? Oh, um, I think a lot of it had to do with um, using online media for things like meetings. Um, we developed a, um, a panel. I've been on numerous panels and, and I find those very difficult to do. Um, you know, that people have talked about the fact that you don't really see the reaction of your audience. And, you know, that can be a difficult thing. It's, it's hard to judge when you can't see people. Um, and then the other, another uh, difficulty we had is um, we developed a community advisory committee, a brand new committee for us. What we want to do is be able to get people from the community, um, scholars, activists, um, people that are involved in their own um, ethnic community to um, help us diversify our collections and also help us um, tell broader stories um, of the people of the area. And we developed this community um, without having actually met a lot of people in person. Um, so you've got a, a, a large group of about uh, 15 people meeting for the first time, all meeting for the first time um, in a group that needs to interact um, on very um, important and yet sensitive issues. And so it's, it's been interesting to watch the, um, the way that that group has evolved. We started in um, June, I believe, or July. And it's been interesting to watch as the, the people have become more comfortable just to see the interactions. Um, and uh, it, I feel like the, the committee has finally started to gel better and has started to be able to, um, to give us the type of in, interaction that I think is a lot easier, again, when you're in person with people. Um, so that was, a, that was certainly a difficulty when, when we first started. Um, I could imagine, and um, I very much appreciate you joining this panel, knowing how hard that technology has been for you over the past year. Um, James, would you like to talk about your hardest learned lesson? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna come at this uh, both as a, a repository manager, but also as a user, someone who enjoys history and and hunts it down any way I can. Um, 
one of the many, many bright lights of, of the last year um, to me has been the social media presence of a lot of repositories um, throughout the country, but, but also in Sacramento. And I, I wanna call out uh, directly the Center for Sacramento History who was really, really aggressive um, with their Instagram posting schedule, um, Facebook, very engaging, very timely um, content. Um, and it drew a connection, I think, be between the institution and standard users, but also users that they've never had before. Um, you know, Jesse mentioned this the other day that, you know, we, we have to find some equivocation between a brick and mortar user and a virtual user. I mean, that, that means something too, to be able to connect, um, you know, over a distance. And so as much as I say as a user and a history buff, way to go Center for Sacramento History, we in the Sacramento room had a really, really hard time with the inability to get that going. Um, we, we don't have our own um, space in social media as the Sacramento room. Um, you know, we're a collection, we're a satellite of the greater monolithic Sacramento Public Library, which is wonderful. Um, but there is a, a singular entry point um, to social media through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, and, and without dragging down my colleagues in, in communication, so I love dearly their consummate professionals and they save my tail every day. Um, it's, it's just the way it is right now for us. Um, you know, hopefully in time we can carve out um, our own presence um, on social media. But to me, over the last year, um, the advantage was implicit. You're getting new users, you're getting new folks because a lot of people are home. And the people who didn't understand Facebook, didn't understand Instagram and didn't understand Twitter now do because they're spending so much time trying to connect with the outside world, the inside world, you know, local and international. So that, that to me was, you know, pretty dispiriting. Um, but, but again, hopefully in time, we're going to be able to get our own little account and um, try to catch up with the Center for Sacramento History. But that's going to be really, really hard because they did a really amazing job. Excellent. And William, did you want to maybe tackle this question as well? Uh, yes. Yeah. So one thing just to build off of James's incredible compliments about our organization was actually putting all of that into practice where right before lockdown, I came off of paternity leave for less than two weeks and we went right back into lockdown. So doing that, having to be home and then having to adapt of, okay, how much can I get into the office just to be able to work without a screaming child versus whoever else can or can't go into the office. So the individual who was actually overseeing all of our social media pro projects was working remotely for as much as she possibly could while I was trying to get into the office as much as we could. So for me, one of the difficult things was saying, okay, we've got this one job. How do we divide it between two or more people to keep it flowing very well? So we're all taking on new responsibilities, but not the entire project. So at certain times I'm picking up 20%, 30% or 50% of an entire project while someone else kind of has to take up the other part of it, all while we're dealing with the realities of the pandemic and the realities of working from home and having our lives ourselves. So for me, that, that kind of bridge between our traditional and structured environment to this whole new crazy world where I will sometimes be working on something very important while there's a disaster happening with a two-month-old right next to me or being in a meeting and 
getting hit in the face was a block that my daughter happens to be playing with. So juggling these and on top of that, also realizing that this digital world, while it's somewhere that I'm familiar and comfortable with, I'd previously worked remotely doing contracts and other things for years before this was an entirely foreign landscape for a lot of people, you know, both within our profession and members of the public. So having to you know, sometimes be a little more patient and speak with someone and say, okay, here's what you do. Here's how you find it. You have to click over here. No, 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 not that one. It's, it's a little bit different, but you know, I'm, I'm also guilty myself of being a little inconvenient at times where if I wake up at five in the morning, I can get four hours of work done before 9 a.m. when my children wake up and then I have to stop and take a break. And I realize that you know, sometimes I'm sending people emails at 5.30 in the morning, which isn't the most convenient thing, particularly if anyone has a, a ringtone on their phone. So it's adapting to the new world, doing what you can while trying your best to maintain and increase services, but doing it in an entirely different and foreign manner where responsibilities and workflows are new being created on the fly. Um, yeah, wow, that's, that's a lot. Um, so I guess we are kind of entering a transitionary time again in the Sacramento region, or I hope we are, where we're starting to reopen, the numbers are looking good, we're thinking eventually we can start planning to return to something similar to what we had before. Um, but I'd really like to ask what um, from this time period uh, that you did differently or that you learned, do you plan to continue after um, we return to this new normal, whatever it might look like? And um, Delta, I'm going to see if you could tackle that one first. Yeah, um, I think that we all have learned that the, the digital presence that we've had to develop um, is here to stay no matter what in some form or fashion, maybe not as much, but certainly there's going to be um, a, a digital um, option and it's, it's increased accessibility, it's increased all of our exposures. So, so it's something that we want to continue to do. With that said, um, as we ramp up more in person, we're going to need to add on that. I, I see that as a place of growth for our education department and for our exhibits. We've also seen, as um, James talked about the archives crawl, some of our events change. Um, we uh, annually do an event in partnership with Soul Collective for Dia de los Muertos. And uh, it's normally 10,000 people in one area on one day. And so we did a similar kind of thing as the archives crawl and spread it out and um, put in uh, installations throughout Old Sacramento, kept it up for a longer amount of time and let people uh, go through and, and visit these, these, um, these altars and insta art installations. And so I think we're going to keep some version of that and continue in that way. So um, in that sense, we, we will continue. Um, we look forward, though, to that in-person experience. There is, um, you know, it, it, is, it is unparalleled. And there are certain things that we found didn't really work well, like our underground tours. We tried doing them virtually, and people really just said, you know, we'll wait till we can do it in person. And uh, so that's, uh, that's how we'll, we'll, we'll address that. The other thing is with school groups. Um, because we've been able to have access to schools throughout the country, as opposed to just throughout the region, uh, I do believe that schools will have to look for virtual opportunities. The days of loading up a bunch of kids into a school bus and bringing in them to locations um, may not be as frequent, and, and there will be more opportunity, I think, for schools to access uh, things well out of their region through these digital programs that um, we've all learned how to do more of and better. And so I, I think that that part's going to, to stay as well. Um, but in the meantime, we are excited that we are in the red and we are open and people, I, I can't tell you how much I missed hearing voices outside my office and 
children laughing or, or you know or people talking and and so you know the last few days that's been really gratifying i didn't realize how much i had missed that so i think that's uh, just some of what we'll we'll continue on doing excellent that sounds like a really good blend um jesse did you want to talk about what the state library might continue doing Absolutely. Um, so we had uh, an opportunity um, to expand something we had tried a little bit of um, prior to the pandemic, um, and that was transcription. Um, so at, as, as you may know, you know, creating digital surrogates of collections and making them accessible online doesn't necessarily make them um, accessible for people with disabilities, and it doesn't necessarily make them searchable. And so um, we started with, uh, we had been using From the Page, um, which is a website that allows you to have a historical document up um, next to an area where you can transcribe it. Um, and then we received the transcripts um, that people complete. And this is kind of crowdsourced. Anyone can participate. Um, there are projects publicly available on From the Page. Um, and so this kind of led us to a larger effort where we started running our own internal transcription projects. Um, and so I think um, over the course of the past year, we've transcribed more than 6,000 historical documents and government documents. Um, and this is really going to be a component of our digitization process going forward so that when we're creating you know, digital surrogates of collections, they're accessible for everyone and so that they're also searchable and it's easier to find things that you're interested in looking for um, within those documents. Um, so that was something we'd really like to expand and continue going forward. Um, so we are continuing to upload collections to from the page and we're also running uh, transcription projects internally as well. Excellent, and then um, we're almost out of time, but James, would you like to speak to that as well? You are muted, James. <laughs> Dang, I thought I was going to make it without having that happen. So, um, yeah. So we we basically uh, live, eat, breathe outreach. Uh, we we present all throughout the county as much as we can. Obviously, the pandemic blunted that, uh, so we made that pivot over to Zoom, um, and it had great effect. Um, so that's probably the kind of thing that we're going to keep around with programming. Um, geographically, um, you all know Central Library is downtown. It's a beautiful setting, but parking can be a real challenge for folks. So um, if we can Zoom these programs, um, that's going to make life a whole lot easier for everyone. Um, so that's one thing that I think we're probably going to cling to, um, possibly come up with a sort of hybrid insofar as how we decide to present. The other thing um, that we'll probably look at continuing um, would be remote internships. Uh, every academic year, we have two students from Sacramento State, the public history program, that come in and digitize for us. It's a paid internship. And uh, it's been a loving relationship going back seven, eight years. It's, it's just been great. But because digitization is such a tough thing to do, um, if you're not there, it's very time and place. Um, we just couldn't have them in. Now, one thing that did work out was we, we had a student from Sacramento City College and their library science program that we were able to do a remote internship with. Um, and it culminated in the creation of uh, a manuscript collection relative to New, New Helvetia housing development, um, its history, um, its civil rights dimension, and then also the current effort to, um, to save these structures and these homes um, that, that people occupy. Um, and on top of that, we had our intern, her name is Amrit uh, Sandhu. In fact, I think she is present this evening. 
Um, and Amrit went ahead and created a display. I sent her the dimensions of the display case. And so she was able to do a lot of that um, at home. Um, and then once things loosened up a bit, she was able to come in, complete the display. And then she had a great idea um, and that was to do a video display. And I've just popped the link to it. It's on YouTube. Um, it's on the Sacramento history page if you want to take a look, but it was a brilliant idea um, executed by a, uh, a, a terrific intern uh, and uh, it just really, really worked out. So it, it's about five, six minutes long, touches all the bases. Um, and so that's the kind of thing. Again, geographically, we're in kind of a tough spot, not great parking, but we can push things out just like we would a house history um, or a neighborhood history. We can push out these, these video displays to show folks what's going on in the room if they can't make it downtown. So that's the kind of thing that I think we're gonna keep around. Yeah, I know someone said this in the chat, but I am very impressed by what you were able to accomplish with a remote internship. That's really inspiring. Um, well, thank you all so much. Um, we've been getting questions in and our panelists have been so great about responding to them right away in the Q&A in the chat. But um, if our audience does have any other questions, um, feel free to ask us now and we'd be happy to answer. Uh, you know, Ali, really quickly, I did see that, that Dave Stewart had a question about um, access at this point to certain repositories. And obviously I will speak for the, for the Sacramento room and, and Sacramento Public Library. We are slowly opening up our branches, of course, um, throughout the county. But when it comes to the Sacramento room and Central Library, it's pretty tough right now. Um, we are um, sort of in the dark. It's not just the pandemic that complicates things. It's the fact that the building that Central is in and the Sacramento room is in is not, it's, it's not doing well. Um, so we've got some, some issues with infrastructure that will keep us closed for months and months to come, unfortunately. Um, there's a bid process that's going on right now. There's some reme remediation. I'm just gonna say plumbing um, and that should tell you, hopefully all you need to know. Um, but um, one thing that we love doing that we don't mind doing, we have the time, is doing research for you and then pushing the content out to you. Um, you know, you can go to our content DM site and get a bunch of great contact information. This is my email address. Um, you can even call me directly at my desk and I'll take down all your information. I'll do everything I can to get the stuff to you. Um, so be patient, be patient. The Sacramento room will be back. Just gonna be a while. I can second that. Um, I saw the question as well. Um, so we don't specifically have a date in mind for reopening, um, but we're certainly working towards it. We're currently offering curbside pickup um, for state employees uh, who can pick up materials. We're also still sending out interlibrary loans in the mail, um, so you can access uh, the circulating stuff in our collection that way. Um, we're also more than happy to do in-depth research for you um, and to provide you know, scans of materials from the collection um, that would be helpful to you. Um, so please certainly reach out. We're still here in all of the different sections of the library and still performing uh, research. And we're going to work as hard as we can to get you, um, you know, adequate access to the collection uh, in a remote environment for now. I'm going to speak for William. Um, the center uh, is following what the city um, protocols are. So. At this point, we have been told that we are still supposed to keep um, work from remotely from home and um, keep the, basically the building closed until the end of May, I believe. But that may change because of um, things that are, are getting better. Um, but I know that William and our archivists are diligently um, taking um, 
the requests and um, that have become online um, and over the phone. So um, they've been right there um, really helping. Excellent. So we're all still here and willing to help even if uh, it might not be face to face just yet. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, if anyone does have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to forward it on to the correct person. Um, you can find my information on the SAC History Museum website, sachistorymuseum.org, or um, I'm sure on the websites of all of our organizations here, you can reach out to us and we're happy to help you with whatever you might need. Thank you again to our panelists. This was an excellent talk. The hour flew by. I was completely captivated by all of your experiences. And thank you for sharing them. Thank you, everyone. Sally. All right. Thanks have for a having us. <laughs> Wonderful. Bye.